This episode of Back to the Roots podcast is brought to you by Byron Seeds. The folks at Byron Seeds believe organic requires a different perspective, plan, and approach. Organic isn't simply a different type of product or even a different way of farming. It's a different way of thinking, planning, commitment. It's a different philosophy on how to feed the world. Many won't understand, but the people at Byron Seeds do. We're owned by organic dairy farmers. We not only have the product, but we plan, manage, and execute organic. We speak your language, we share your struggles, and we laud your successes. Organic isn't a way of doing business, it's a community. We learn from each other. We're in this together. We'd be glad to talk cropping plans, management systems, the road to profitability. We understand what you're trying to do. We're farmers just like you. Visit us at byronseeds.net or give us a call at 800-801-3596. And thanks to Byron Seeds. You're listening to Back to the Roots Podcast. I'm Mike Klein, and along with Brian Wood, today we are joined by Melvin and Dorothy Lapp from Elizabethville, Pennsylvania. They are organic egg producers and uh, are also transitioning their land to organic. So thank you so much for joining us today. And can you give us a little bit of background on your operation? Sure. Thanks for having us. We produce eggs with a 10,000 bird organic layer barn. And on the home farm, we have about 20 acres. Most of that is in pasture. We have 68 acre farm beside us that we are transitioning into organic cropland. We are on the second year with that. I was raised on a dairy farm. We lived on the farm till I was 18. We moved off the farm. I always enjoyed the field work and I always thought that it would be interesting to raise a family on a farm. We got started with the organic layers back in 2015 and we always had, uh, when we moved on the farm in 2000, there was an old foundation of a broiler house that had fallen down from snow it had been demolished and we always had a dream of rebuilding that barn into a lair barn or something similar to make work for the children and we had that opportunity in 2015 late in 2014 we asked the question to organic valley if they would be looking for more egg production we got the okay to build a 10,000 bird barn and first flock went in in May of 2015. Our oldest children were 12 years old at that time and we have seven children. They all help with the egg production at some point in time. There's some of them that have graduated and some of them that are not helping a lot yet but we enjoy every minute of it and we have never looked back that we wish we would not have done this. We always have been very grateful with what Organic Valley has done for us, and we love it. Mm -hmm. You buy all your feed in for your birds? We do. At this point, we buy 100% of our feed in. We buy the ingredients in, and then we mix it, grind it ourselves. Mm -hmm. Is there a plan to grow your own grain then for your layers or would your land that your transition just be to sell? That is the plan is to help with the grain. Of course we won't be able to grow near all of it with 68 acres but the plan is to at least grow some of it. Yes. Is the price of current price of soybeans hitting you pretty hard? Are you feeling the impact of that? Definitely. Can you find them? We can. At this point, we can still find soybeans. And that is about 25% of our complete feed. So it definitely does affect us. But at this point, uh, 
it doesn't affect us to the point that we don't want to go on. We mm-hmm. definitely want to keep going because we think that there's probably better times ahead. Is there alternatives? Have you looked into that at all? I know that with the price being as high as it is, there's been talk of that. But. Yes, there's definitely alternatives out there. At this point, we're using some alpha alpha meal pellets as alternative protein and to help with the egg yolk color. Alpha alpha does help increase the yolk color. So we add that and it benefits us in a few different ways. Mm-hmm. What is the price of your bean meal? Bean meal right now is going to cost me about 1300 a ton. That's $700 cheaper than where I am. That's oh, is that right? $2,000 a ton. Okay. If you can find it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, would yours, would that be imported bean meal? That is imported. Okay. Mm-hmm. See, we're, we're far enough away from the ports that imported isn't cheaper than domestically grown beans. Mm-hmm. So it's mm-hmm. just expensive. That's all. I think it's going to get more expensive. I'm not sure that the tariffs have quite hit us yet like they're going to at some point. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure that that's even going to be a, you know, a legitimate game plan for the future. But at this point, that's what we have available right now. Mm -hmm. I think it's 85% of the U.S. organic soybean needs is imported. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That high? Yeah. Wow. 80 to 85. Last last I saw it was still up that high. And it's all because they can do it so cheaply. Mm -hmm. Or they've been bringing it in cheaply. And, I mean, that's been the big question or what's driven some of these tariff conversations because they're bringing it cheap. So the question is, is it organic? Mm -hmm. So they've been testing more and putting more regulations on. Mm -hmm. So I think you're right. It's going to continue to – price is going to be tough until domestic takes place, can replace some of the what's missing from importing. Mm -hmm. At this time, our broker that brings in the organic meal has been doing a really good job at verifying Mm -hmm. the organic, um, that what he's bringing in is is organic. We've had ours tested multiple times, and we've never shown anything that is not Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what they said it is. Mm -hmm. So you said you have 10 acres of pasture. That is certified. That's certified. Is that what you or what do you have for outdoor access? What are the requirements? We have about two and a half acres of outdoor access for the chickens, and I'm not exactly sure what the rec- or what the required amount is, but I I know that we're way over on the uh, minimum amount that we need. Mm-hmm. So we have some that's partly in a wooded area where they mostly dust bathe in there. So obviously there's no grass there Mm -hmm. because chickens are really hard on grass wherever they want to dust bathe close to the barn or in shade. So wherever there's shaded areas, there's not going to be any grass there, but they they like both. They like the the, uh, dirt to dust bathe in and just to stay cool. And then they can go out to the grass as well. We mm-hmm. have grass further out that they go out to graze in, mm-hmm. and they they utilize the pasture. They definitely do. Mm-hmm. And what is the square foot requirement for organic eggs, in in the barn? In the barn, our current standards are one point five one square point. square foot per bird. And when you were building that barn, were you thinking that you wanted to go organic, or was organic just the opportunity that? came your way we definitely wanted to go organic and it was it was uh it was a great opportunity for two reasons we wanted to go organic and it was one thing that was available at that time Mm -hmm. so we had not put any inputs on that part of the farm for that reason a couple years before that because you know in case something comes up that if we have the opportunity to go organic that we can Mm -hmm. because that would have definitely been an issue if it would have not have been able to be certified Mm -hmm. now what are the i don't know production egg 
terms or, you know, I know the basics and I hear, you know, laying rate and stuff like that. Can you kind of walk through like what it is you're watching for and what metrics you're trying to hit when you're raising chickens? Sure. Um, so if we, the first couple of flocks that we did, we had a little bit of a time to hit our goal. And at that point, our goal was 90% at their peak. And we were challenged with that a little bit. We had some health issues with our first flock. And um, I think it was about the third flock that we switched our nutritionists, went to a different nutrition plan. And uh, we hit 95% with almost every flock since that. So 95% at their peak is very good. And then they'll just kind of go down from that. And they hit their peak at about 30 weeks, 30 to 35 weeks of age. So we get them into the barn at 18 weeks. They start laying at 20 to 22 weeks. And at first, there's a lot of um, small eggs which we call those pullet eggs, and those might be a little purple-shelled or off-color, um, different things like that, odd shape, double yolks. But about 24 weeks, 24 to 30 weeks, they really, the eggs start getting really nice, a nice color. And from about 40 or 50 weeks on, they'll be starting to get a little maybe a little uh, spots on the shells or different things like that. Not that it affects the the uh, quality of the egg at all, but it just doesn't look quite as nice. And that might be, you know, maybe one or 2% of the eggs that we'll have to pull out because of that. But for the most part, they do get graded afterwards. So uh, anything that we miss will get graded out at the uh, packaging plant. Mm -hmm. So 90 to 95% is a good um, metric for uh, egg production. And that is all on nutrition. It is. I feel that's a, that does a big part. And not just while they're laying, but also while they're in the pullet house being raised from day-old chicks to 18 weeks of age mm -hmm. when they're ready to start laying. Mm-hmm. So that's one thing that we've really noticed already is that it's very important while they're growing to get that same nutrition that they need while they're laying. And how much control do you have over that? Or is it just more so picking the right pullet producer? Um, that might be part of it, but we actually have quite a bit of control over that because we have guys that will work with us that we're allowed to send our own feed in there. Okay. So we're allowed to produce our own feed, send it into where they're being grown, and then they feed that feed. So that's the nice thing about about uh, owning our own birds. Like we buy them from the hatchery, and then we have control with what goes into their feed all the way up until they come into our barn, mm -hmm. which at that point then we mix our mix our own feed, and we keep... We keep that um, that ration part of it that we can put in whatever they need. Mm -hmm. So they land at 18 weeks in your barn, and how long they peak at 30, and then how long are they in after that before you? We usually we usually uh, send them out at about 70 weeks. Okay. Um, usually they're between 85 and 90 percent of production at that point. But yeah, we usually keep them to about 70 weeks of age. And then how long will your barn stay unfilled? What do you what you clean out and do everything and how, how long until you refill again? We usually figure two to three weeks. We usually clean out, make sure everything is clean, and then give it a little bit of time to stay empty just to make sure that there's no bacteria in the barn that can, you know over winter or that can go into the next flock so mm -hmm. we we need time and it needs to be dry in that time frame so that no bacteria goes through from one flock to the next and of course then disinfect is also a part of that plan so you'd have the barn you would have no egg production for what about six weeks out of um you know? 
it's usually about six to eight weeks before we start shipping eggs or before yeah before we start shipping eggs and then the first eggs might be smaller than than your optimal size but is there a market for those usually not a very good one mm-hmm. you can go into a breaker market or okay other products and the breaker market is not a good market to be in that's usually not a real good market no mm-hmm. so as far as like once you are producing eggs again what are the important factors that you're looking for? You mentioned yolk color. You mentioned um, color of the shell, um, the strength of the shell. What are those things that you're looking for? What are What is the market looking for, I guess? Yeah. Um, so a really big part of the market demand is yolk color. And we need to be at an 8 in yolk color. So the way we do that is we add ingredients to get yolk color. So we might add a, um, a uh, it's, it's a petal of a mar- marigold, marigold. Yeah. marigold. Mm-hmm. And then also a product from paprika. It's actually a ground paprika that is the red color. So we're actually adding healthy ingredients to get the yolk color, not just some synthetic Mm -hmm. um, coloring. And then the other important thing is, of course, the shell color. That's not something that you eat, but it's also important in just the the, uh, visualization of the egg. When you look at it, it looks nice. So we want to make a brown egg. So we, we can't really control that except for water quality. We make sure that we give them good, clean drinking water so that they don't have all kinds of bacteria in their system that comes out through the eggshell. So we make sure. So that's why my five hens that I have have weird colored eggs would be from bacteria in the water. Or can they go outside? Yeah. And they, they, uh, water puddles, if it rains, they love rainwater. Well, rainwater is never really clean after it's on the ground and the hens are scraping around in the mud. So it could be, you know, a factor of it. Because, you know, I've got a five-gallon water for five chickens, so it's not necessarily fresh mm-hmm. water every day. Well, that, and if it rains outside, you probably don't use very much water out of that because they love getting water out of the puddles rather mm-hmm. than getting out of the nibbles. <laughs> I'm learning something, <laughs> but I don't care how the eggs look, you know, for me, of course, but you know, right. in your world. So if, if the shell color is off, is that a reject? It is. We pull those out. Okay. If they're, if they're white or purple or kind of two tone or something like that, we'll pull those out. Mm-hmm. And do you factor that into your 95%? We do. Okay. Yep. We do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the 95% would be eggs that you sell. No. That's just eggs percentage. Eggs that they produce. Eggs that they produce. That's right. Okay. And as far as yolk color, I, I assume that part of the reason why that's so important, and it seems like that's gotten more important over the last five, you might be able to correct me here, five to ten years. And it, is that partially i know i've got backyard chickens mike's got backyard chickens backyard chickens has been like this especially during the covid times has been Mm -hmm. something that people have wanted to take up and when they crack that egg they i can't believe the yolk color is that kind of where that uh market is or why that's being demanded you're trying to replicate what people can't produce on their own that's right Mm -hmm. that's right it seems like it's a it's being uh, it's being sought after, and they really like when they crack open that egg and it has a really yellow looking yolk. And it's um, some people may think it's a healthy color. I don't know that it does a lot to your health, but it it does look nice if you crack open an egg and it has a yellow yolk. Or orange. Orange. Yeah. That's that's the big one. I know. Mm-hmm. You know, you crack open an egg and you get that dark orange yolk, and it's like you want to show that off to everybody. Right. Hey, look at look at yeah. this. 
It is nice. So is there is there some variation allowed in the yolk color? There is. Like because you clearly can't reject an egg for yolk color. Do they do that? Do they just test so many eggs out of your barn to see if your yolk color is hitting? They do. So we get tested every two weeks. And we get tested, I think, with about two dozen eggs. So they'll take an average of those two dozen, and then that's what our yolk color is. And then two weeks later, they'll take another test. And if it's, as long as it's at an eight, then we're okay. But it's allowed to be anything over that. And when you say eight, what kind of scale are we talking here? Like it's yellow to orange? Um, the numbers go from, I mean, like the, the numbers that we see are 4 to 12 or 14. There's some egg producers that actually produce a a 12, which I don't like that one because I think it's too red. It looks too unnatural. And I, I really like the 8 because I think that's the more natural looking one. Where when you get up to a twelve, it looks it looks like a deep red, and it does not look natural. And that would just be from the marigold and paprika, or absolutely. <laughs> wow, absolutely. So you don't have to put any seasoning on your eggs. If you feed them that much paprika. Right, right. That would be one benefit from that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, like, so as far as like in the actual market, you know, you've got. Like we we were talking, backyard chickens is a big thing. So that's obviously pulling people away from buying eggs in the store. And then the other thing, especially in the organic market, is have you seen struggles with... So we work a lot more with dairy and, you know, crop ground that requires a three-year transition. You Or on the animals, you have a full year of transition on cows. Um, with chickens, it's relatively easy to get into the organic market. And I know there's a lot of companies that will switch barns back and forth. Um, has, has it gotten a lot more competitive because of that ease of entry? It's easier to enter into the organic egg market than it would be to, say, produce organic milk just at the drop of a hat. So your question is if it's easier to if it's easy to get into the organic egg market has that, that impacted you? Or? Absolutely that has impacted us. Mm-hmm. Um we have been seeing a decline in um shelf like retail egg prices for the past years. Um and then with that are there are there backyard chicken farmers or individuals that have a backyard flock that don't realize their true cost of a egg definitely my neighbor has um, a dozen chickens and he has been buying feed from me just out of my whenever I mix some I'll dump a hundred pounds into a barrel for him and he told me lately that it doesn't pay him to produce eggs if he can buy them at the store for the price that he can. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So back to your question, it uh, it is becoming increasingly difficult to stay on top of that um, because there's so much pressure on the price. Um, we have a lot of people in our area that produce organic eggs the opportunity isn't there like it was at one time to switch back and forth, and most of the people wouldn't want to switch from what they have with Organic Valley just because of you know the commitment that Organic Valley has with producing eggs, milk, all the things that they produce. Um, there's so much uncertainty out there with the other companies as well mm-hmm. when they jump back and forth. Mm-hmm. So uh, I don't think anybody is actually has their own chickens to save money on eggs. You know, when you look at what you can buy a dozen of organic eggs for in the store, that's true. It will be way cheaper than me feeding my chickens. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. But it's, 
I don't know, there's something about raising your own food mm -hmm. and having your own, whether it be beef or whatever it is, uh, I really enjoy. So, That's true. Mm -hmm. But the, the egg market has been unbelievably competitive forever, hasn't it? Not forever. I wouldn't say that. Okay. Um, probably, probably it has gone in in, uh, in, in waves. So back in the 70s, there was a lot of people that had egg production, chicken houses. And there was a lot of eggs being produced in 10,000 bird flocks at that time. At that time, they were cage birds. Nobody knew anything about organic. So when when they started producing organic eggs, then we were able to be competitive again, or we were able to make it work in our in our communities. Um, it works really good. But now there's big companies producing organic eggs with questionable standards. So are all those standards reliable source of organic, reliable source of pastured? Are we all the same? No, we're not. We don't all have the same standards. Are they all organic eggs? I think they are all organic eggs. But we do have different standards, so... And I think, like I said, we go in waves. So, you know, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, there was a lot of egg production going on. In the past 10 years, there's been a lot of lot of newborns mm -hmm. being put up for egg production. And there still are. But there has been some good times in the egg industry. We've seen some really good years since we were producing eggs. And, you know, now we're seeing some some down times, but I think it'll, I think it'll turn around again. And I assume that some of the, you know, downtime or, you know, being in a downtime is it's gotten competitive. That means price has been driven down. That's right. So once that happens, I assume that you're looking for another point of differentiation, something that you're doing that say a big barn or a big company wouldn't be able to do. Um, and I know I've seen, um, you know, stuff like pasture eggs and you know they've got the rainbow eggs you know i've seen mm -hmm. some of that in specialty stores like blue sure. eggs and stuff like that um, what are those things that you can do that are different than so i live in michigan and herbrooks is a big company that does eggs and they've got the concrete porches that go over and they call it organic um, and in northern indiana they're building well, what are they, 20,000 bird houses? So very large houses, and there's not much of a pasture standard for them. Um, there is, but how much they build the barns so that it's, the birds don't want to go outside. <laughs> so, you know, they're doing it cheaper. Mm -hmm. So where's a spot that you can do it on a little bit smaller scale, but do it with a point of differentiation? Well, I think one of those, and I, I hear it a lot, and you mention it, is pasture. When we talk about animal standards, you know, one of the things that they, they discuss when we talk about animal standards is that the animal has the ability to do what they want to do in their normal activities. And I think one of those, one of those things that is huge is pasture. So I just think that pasture is one of the things that gets overlooked a lot, I think. Because when we started, there was people that told us that birds don't even want to go outside. And I have not found that to be the case. When our doors go open to let the birds outside, they're going out through there as fast as they can. In a matter of a minute, probably half the birds are outside right away mm -hmm. and they love going outside now if it's really warm on a hot day they won't be out in the sun they don't like being hot just like we don't like being out in the sun we like the shade or wherever it's more comfortable for them to be in the shade mm -hmm. so on a really hot day you won't see a lot of birds outside but if it's cool outside they love being out there so I think that's one of the things where we can differentiate our our uh, 
standards is to let them go outside. Um, I know there's a lot of other things that, that play a part in that, but um, obviously the bigger you go, the harder it is to to get that full influence of having each bird doing what they want to do mm-hmm. when you have 20,000 birds um, in one barn. You know, that's a big difference from 10,000. Mm-hmm. Some people might think 10,000 seems like a really large barn, and it is. There's a lot of birds in there. Um, but if you have enough of doors and have enough of places with doors, they still have the equal opportunity to do what they want to do. So um, I think there's other things that could be done um, that would make it a a uh, better thing for the for the birds. You could talk about um, comfort when they're in the house, when they're in the barn. We have curtain side barns that through the summer the curtains are down, through the winter the curtains are up, so therefore it sustains the heat in the barn through the winter and they have they make enough of body heat that they can keep it comfortable in the barn. Through the through the summer it seems like you almost have to give them a little bit of air movement so they can stay cool. So I think there's some things that could be done to to benefit the birds. And do you feel that is done through standards by a, by any whatever company is selling the eggs or um, is that yeah I, I mean I guess I don't know exactly what the question is there mm-hmm. but uh, is or should everyone be doing that I guess is what I'm trying to say I think it would be best if everyone would do that on their own but unfortunately it's probably not going to work that way because we're not all the same. We don't think the same. We don't think alike. Not nearly everyone. So, um. But I think there's going to be, you almost, so the outdoor access thing uh, in organics is a little bit, a lot like the grazing rule, where there is some, in the organic industry, there is some abuse of that and loopholes used in that rule. And I think, until certifiers start cracking down on the people that are not doing it the way it, the, the rule is intended, there's going to be people pushing that line as far as they can until a certifier takes somebody out behind the woodshed and tells them, no, you're not doing this anymore. But until that happens, the, the rule is going to be abused. And that's what, it, it doesn't make it a level playing field. I think that's one of the biggest areas of abuse in animal standards. I agree with you, Mike. I think that's that's a, a big area that gets abused. Mm-hmm. And different standards, different people's standards, different companies' standards require more or less. So whichever company you're with, that's the standards that you have to follow. That's how the normal, normal procedure is right now. Mm-hmm. As long as they meet the certification requirements then it's up to each individual company to set their standards. If the USDA certified organic requirement would be the bare minimum. That's the bare minimum. Yep. And how many uh, barns are there that that minimum isn't even reached without being outdoor access? No, that's, that bothers me a lot. There's probably some that don't mm-hmm. even reach that. Mm-hmm. There's some producers I know in the in the dairy industry there is some producers that have their own organic certifier license. So the company itself is their own certifier, organic certifier. Be handy. I wow. think they use that to their benefit. Mm-hmm. The hard part for the farmer in having you know the organic standards be the minimum and then having another company set higher standards is that means for you as a farmer you have a lot more regulations you have a lot more audits you have a lot more paper trail and i know we hear from farmers quite a bit that well you're taking the fun out of farming you know this isn't what farming should be um but 
at the same time to sell a product there's not much other choice that I can see that's the way I look at it if a farmer doesn't want to do the paperwork that it takes for animal care standards or the work I think they should probably consider a different occupation and I mean that in a very kind way because Mm -hmm. I think there's always going to be somebody that's going to be willing to do that. Mm -hmm. So as long as there's somebody that's willing to do that, I don't feel like they're going to have a choice or like we aren't going to have a choice. Because Mm -hmm. if we don't, we're teaching our children to do... So at home, we have these weekly, daily, monthly checklists that we need to do. So the way I do it is... I train my 12-year-old how to do it. I follow up with him to make sure that he does it, that he does it properly. So we're teaching them how to do these things. Now, if I, if I say I don't want to do them, he knows how. It's a sense of responsibility for him. He's 12 years old. So what, what makes me think that there's not going to be somebody that's going to want that sense of responsibility and want that market that's available all of a sudden because farmer doesn't want to do their paperwork. Mm -hmm. Somebody's going to do it. Mm -hmm. I think that's the big thing with, with animal care standards. I agree that the, the, the line is always going to be pushed. We've got to have to understand we're in the internet age where people have access to absolutely all the information they need and way more than they need. But, you know, so the animal care standards are going to keep evolving and getting tougher. I mean, across all of animal agriculture. And I think you cannot stick your head in the sand or dig in and say, we're not doing anymore because guess what? Somebody else will. That's right. So we have to just be willing to evolve. And and I know uh, some of the standards that are going to be coming in the next five years are we're going to think they're really dumb. But it doesn't matter. Somebody, somebody will do them. That's right. So if we want to be in the game, we got to play the rules that the game is is based on. That's right. The daily, weekly, monthly checklists are those things that you put together yourself, or do those come from animal care standards? Those come from our animal care standards that we are obligated to to meet. So I guess it, you're trying to look at it from the bright side is, right. you know, those added standards probably in a way made you a better manager. They probably did. Even though I know there's going to be people that don't like it, don't like being told this is what you need to do. But at the same time, there are some things that you probably didn't realize you needed to do that are now being done and are helping your flock. But this goes way back. Back in the 70s, my wife's parents had a 10,000 bird layer barn, cage barn, and they did not have cooling for their eggs. It wasn't required. So at some point, it came along as a requirement. That was one of the things that made them question if they want to keep going with it because they were required to put cooling in. So at that point, it didn't make sense for them to add a $5,000 investment or whatever it was back then to add cooling for all of these eggs. It just didn't make sense. And I don't think that was the only thing that they got out of the business, but that was one of the things that contributed to that. Well, it's been a long time since we had to do cooling for eggs it's just a given when we built our chicken house that we had to add cooling as a startup cost and it wasn't even really Mm questioned of course you have to add cooling for your eggs (laughs) Mm -hmm. so that's one of the things that you know somebody's going to do it down the line somebody's going to bite the bullet and just Mm -hmm. do it Mm -hmm. because it needs to be done and 30 years down the road you're going to look back and go well you mean there was a time when we didn't have to do that? Like, that's crazy when you just think of cooling. Like, you have 10,000 birds and no cooling for your eggs, you know. But 
when when the change happens it's fresh it is raw and you might not like it but most of the things will, you'll get used to i guess that's right well this was a really interesting conversation melvin i i really appreciate you being on and, and explaining the egg business um i know nothing about eggs or didn't know anything about eggs and but i feel like i know a lot more now so i'll check out my own eggs a little closer and see what i'm doing wrong there you go. but uh thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with me and brian today sure thank you, thank you.